holding you tight as we spin round the floor. Feeling your heart beating, calling for more. Waltz was invented for you and for me. Waltzing is something comes naturally. How would I feel if you wanted to waltz with some other guy with no dancing faults? Bury my heart, hide all my thoughts. So dance yourself stupid. Save me the waltz. This is the ballroom in Brocket Hall, just on the outskirts of London. And the reason we're here is because this is the room where the waltz was first danced in English society. Now, you've got to understand that the waltz, when it was first introduced into society, was a very wicked dance. It was scandalous. Because up until the waltz, you only touched fingertips in all the quadrilles and the dances they did before. And then suddenly it goes from fingertips to full frontal tight held, whizzing round the floor. The reason we're here is because I'm about to make an album of waltzes. I've always loved waltzes. I've always loved things about the waltz rhythm. Uh, and the point about being here in Brocket Hall is not that this was just the first place it was danced, but I was born in a room upstairs during the Blitz. Some people might say it's eccentric to make an album of waltzes and fair play to them. Of course it's eccentric, but I've never been fully in the centre. You know, I've always kind of veered off. And this place, Brocket Hall, if you want eccentricity, this place is wildly eccentric. I'll show you around some of the places and tell you about some of the things that went on, because they will make your hair stand on it. This painting here is George IV when he was Prince of Wales. And the reason this painting is here is because he was one of Lady Melbourne's lovers. In Regency times, if you married a boring lordship, you'd marry him, you'd provide him with an heir, and then you were on your own. You could then have as many affairs as you like as long as you keep them discreet. That means you don't flash them in front of the rest of society. So Lady Melbourne did exactly that. After she had supplied Lord Melbourne with um, his, his new son, Peniston, uh, she then went on to have four other children, two by Lord Egremont, who sounded like a real wild man from Petworth House down in Sussex, uh, not happy with his 49 children and his 14 mistresses in the house and J.M.W. Turner in the library. He'd come up here from time to time uh, to continue his affair with Lady Melbourne. She had two children by him. She then had an affair with the Grand Old Duke of York, Frederick, had a son, Frederick, by him, and then had her final affair with the man, with uh, Prince of Wales, and had a son by him, George. Uh, of her children, one went on to become, and these are her love children, one went on to become Prime Minister, uh, and the other, Emma, I believe, uh, went on to marry a future Prime Minister, Lord Palmerston, who was her lifelong lover, while she was, in her own way, married to another boring old lord until the lord snuffed it, and then she married Lord Palmerston because they were sweethearts. George IV is here because he presented this to Lord Melbourne and Lady Melbourne. What you see there is a nice, slim-looking George IV with a horse's ass, which was his gift to Lord Melbourne for having cuckolded him with his wife. As well as the ballroom, this is where they would have the big banquets when royalty was in or when it was a really big stuff. Other times they'd eat in the room next door or even another one. There was a selection of rooms and dining rooms according to the status of the people who were there. The story goes that Lady Caroline, who was the incumbent here, uh, uh, that one night she appeared out of a tureen on the middle of the table and leapt out of the tureen naked. So she was a wild woman. And even though she called uh, Byron mad, bad and dangerous to know, she was pretty dangerous to know too. Because the story is that Byron, uh, having had his affair, wanted to drop her. So she stalked him and kept on stalking him. Uh, and he just didn't want to know. Uh, he also hated the waltz because he had a club foot. 
So what she would do is she'd go to dances or balls with Byron in tow and he'd have to sit it out with his club foot, fuming, and she'd dance around. Hey, look, see how easy it is, how I can move. Uh, and somewhere or other he's written a hate poem against waters. <laughs> This is the great Lord Palmerston, who was an Anglo-Irish peer and had the gift of the gab and, as you can see, was very pretty too. So he was a definite ladies' man. They loved him. He finally married his lifelong lover, Emma, who was one of the Melbournes. And having married her, uh, he moved into Brockett Hall, this place that resounds with sexual uh, scandal and shenanigans. And he was very happy here. He became Prime Minister of England. Uh, but finally, they say, met his maker here in this billiard room when he uh, had sex with a chambermaid on this very table. He got his leg over at the age of 81. And that was it. That is Emily, not Emma. Lord Palmerston married Lord Melbourne's sister. And then, once Melbourne died, they moved to Brockett Hall and lived here for the rest of the time. Lord Palmerston died in 1865 in the billiard room under somewhat unsavoury circumstances. Legend has it that he collapsed in the arms of a serving woman whilst they were cavorting on the billiard table. In other words. <laughs> in other words. Cavorting. So, OK, so this is the Prime Minister's suite. Mm -hmm. because Lord Melbourne was Prime Minister and then Palmerston, who died cavorting on the billiard table, uh, was also Prime Minister. So I was born in this room. I was born in this room on the night of the 14th to the 15th of November 1940. Now, that's a very significant night, and that significance is why I was brought out here to be born. Because just before the 14th, the British government got intelligence that the Luftwaffe were going to do a huge raid and were going to completely flatten London. So on that night or a day before, my mum was brought out with a lot of other expectant mothers out to Brockett Hall, which by that time had become a maternity home. And on the night of the 14th of November, which was the night of the full moon, uh, and the November full moon is called the Hunter Moon or the Blood Moon. The Luftwaffe were choosing that night because it was going to be full moon so they could see everything. But they weren't bombing London, they were bombing Coventry. So on the night Coventry was completely raised to the ground, I was pulled out of my mother's communist womb with a pair of rusty forceps. So I was a forceps baby, I obviously didn't want to come out. Uh, into this room here. I don't say the doctor himself was a Nazi, but a room in a house owned by one of the great Nazi lovers. Can't say this is the original bed, but this is Lord Melbourne's suite. Now apparently uh, there was a secret passageway around the back of this so that the Prince of Wales, when he'd come up, could go to his discreet assignations with Lady Melbourne. So this will be Lady Melbourne's suite. Right. Obviously situated at a reasonable distance from the husband who's now retired from any kind of congress or shenanigans with the wife. And you see, all this chinoiserie is the stuff that uh, George IV loved. And you will find pictures uh, from the Imperial War Museum of mothers in the 40s in the war uh, with all their babies. That's long lines of mums, a maternity ward, uh, and the walls are covered with kind of bamboo-type stuff. Again, that was all stuff that George IV um, put up all over Brockett Hall, rather like a kind of tomcat spraying. Nice. Oh. Poetic, that. That is. Yeah. Second Lord Brockett was a big-time Nazi. Nothing really surprising in that, because most of the British aristocracy thought that Hitler was a jolly good chap. But Ronald, second Lord Brockett, thought he was a really good guy. 
uh, and he and his friend the Duke of Buccleuch went over in April 1939 to Berlin to celebrate Adolf's 50th birthday with their mate. So we're saying big time Nazi. Now this was weird for me because my mum and dad were big time communists. And with my dad on the Central Committee of the British Communist Party, I mean big time. So it's a very strange kind of irony to start my life coming from communist parents and being born in a Nazi stately home. And is that something that has uh, proliferated through most of your life, as you say? Well, I think it was my introduction to the sense of irony that has probably ruled my life ever since. (laughs) ¶¶